Hello, hello. Yeah, so I've gone full Madonna, which is nice. Um, right, click to start. It says on my notes. So weird that two of us are using this retro software to give our talks. Um, you know, and I brought the system up in uh, less than two days, so I'm a solid medium in terms of my personal skill level. I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, let me just quit out of this nonsense and start my proper presentation. So when I gave this talk in the US, um, I apologized in advance for the swearing, uh, but I figured my adorable British accent would let me get away with it. But <laughs> I am aware, perhaps, in recent times, a British accent might be received slightly differently in Europe, given my nation's recent history. Uh, maybe I can win the love of the European room by demonstrating a history of British cultural exports. I know one person here shares my love of the Spice Girls, so that's one out of 700. Uh, maybe the Beatles and the inventors of the microphone, another British gift to the world. Firstly, sorry for all that Brexity shit, um, and for the succession of idiots that we keep electing. Uh, if I did want the conference to happen in Brighton, I could also reassure you that your money will go a long way in the UK as well, because our currency is worth basically nothing now. Um, secondly, the swears are staying in, even if the accent doesn't save me. This talk is about history. Uh, not musical history, not ancient operating systems, but the story of our craft. Uh, but before that, and because who doesn't love it? A little audience participation. Uh, these are not object shapes. These are just circles. However, what you do need to know is that they are different sizes. Now, I think, I don't think any of the distortion will, uh, I think it's all the same on all the screens. Um, there is a fundamental difference. So let's see, by show of hands, uh, who is a good judge of size. Who thinks the blue circle is bigger? Okay. And who thinks the red circle is bigger? Hmm, interesting. What's the answer? Everyone who put their hand up is wrong. What was your instinct when the two circles appeared? That they're the same, right? So the real question is, how many white guys with a microphone did it take to tell you these two identical circles were different before you shrugged, said, sure, and tried to choose between them? Hold that thought as we bounce around the last 100 years or so. Welcome to Cambridge, an ancient seat of learning. This is how you might imagine it. It's 2018. I'm sat in the audience within the brutal-looking 60s-built Churchill College. I'm in a stifling lecture hall, a room full of people, but not anywhere near as nice as this. It's the Business of Software Conference. Lectures from the good and the great on how to build successful software businesses. What the hell am I doing there? Uh, by 2018, I'm the CTO of a small software company, uh, having started my computing journey 30 years ago, copying code from magazines into my Acorn Electron, via a computer science degree, uh, to being a relatively early adopter of Rails. I'm no ingenue, as my receding hairline will attest. I had a little bit of a funny moment when uh, the previous speaker was saying, 2001, that was a long time ago. I'm like, 2001? It's the fucking future. I've got decades of experience of handcrafting artisanal bugs for the internet. Anyway, back in the room of the business of software, a speaker comes on and starts to tell their story. I had never heard of them. And the story they told changed what I thought I knew about the history of our industry. Aged five, Steve Shirley arrived in Britain as a child refugee as part of the kinder transport. Convent school followed in the Midlands, and then high school close to the Welsh border. Steve excelled in mathematics, but given their situation, faced a battle to be allowed to take it. You see, in the early 50s, there was no standard curriculum in the UK, and early each school ran according to the whims of the individual headmasters or mistresses. Leaving school and after becoming a British citizen, Steve joined the post office research station in North London, part of the early vanguard of the UK's post-war computing boom. Evenings were filled with an honours degree in mathematics, 
And another job followed after a decade at the post office, firing code into more early computers, such as this little beauty, the uh, ICT-1301. So far, so typical of a programming career at the time. But it's when the story reached 1962 that I really sat up in my chair. In 1962, Steve Shirley incorporated freelance programmers with a capital of six pounds. Now, as I've already said, that's well, not worth anything now. Um, but it was approximately the cost of a venti gingerbread latte these days, and not much more back then. So later, the company became F International. In their 2012 memoir, they said, it sounded mad. Drawbacks included the following. I had no capital to speak of. I had no experience running a company. I had no employees. I had no office, no customers, and no reason to believe that anyone wanted to buy my product. Nobody sold software in the 60s. So far as it existed, it was given away free with the machines it ran on. So what would happen to the freelance pro programmers? Would our hero be successful? Well, yes, it was the Business Software Conference. Given, given it's a conference about how to be good at writing software and being in business, yes. It prospered for decades. Projects included planning routes for Tate and Lyle sugar lorries, uh, calculating depot locations for oil companies, and even the black box for Concord. They went international, the US, several European countries, and even growing through acquisition in India. In 1996, they floated on the stock exchange only two years before this idiot started his degree. This is a huge commercial UK software success story. And they pioneered a few remarkable things. The workforce was primarily remote in the 60s. They worked firstly with overnight post, and then later, telephones, as those became more available. The workforce was flexible, both in hours worked and the strength of the independence of the programmers. Folks only had to work 20 hours a week, and the management and staffing of projects was really dynamic. The profits were shared. In 1981, Steve Shirley established a shareholders' trust and progressively gave away a controlling share of the whole company to the workforce, so that when the IPO happened, over 70, 70 employees became millionaires. Oh, one more thing. Of the first 300 staff, 297 of them were women. Steve Shirley made a success by hiring an unorthodox workforce, even as the rest of the industry was struggling to find programmers as the business world rapidly computerized. And there was a reason for that, because this is who was on stage. She's an OBE. She's a dame. She's a ch. What the hell is a ch? The, the CH is a companion of honor, one of the highest honors you can receive in the UK. There are only ever 65 at one time. Current, compa uh, current companions of honor include Ian McKellen, Paul McCartney, Elton John, Judy Dench, and multiple former prime ministers. This is the group that she is a part of. And I hadn't heard of her at all or her trailblazing software company. She exuded warmth, insight, and elegance from the stage. Here she is from a TED talk in 2015. Uh, I'm gonna need some audio for that. And in those days, uh, I couldn't work on a stock uh, exchange, oh yeah. I couldn't drive a bus or fly an airplane. Uh, um, indeed, I couldn't open oh. a bank account without my husband. Right, give me a sec. There we go. For years, I was the first woman this, or the only woman that. And in those days, I couldn't work on a stock exchange, I couldn't drive a bus or fly an aeroplane. Um, indeed, I couldn't open a bank account without my husband's permission. My generation of women fought the battles for the right to work and the right for equal pay. Nobody really expected much from people at work or in society because all the expectations then were about home and family responsibilities. And I couldn't um, really face that and so started to challenge the, the conventions of the time, even to the extent of changing my name from Stephanie to Steve in my business development letters so as to get through the door before anyone realized that he was a she. <laughs> Computing wasn't just happening in little old blighty in the 50s and 60s. 
It was also happening in the mighty United States of America. Let's cross the Atlantic and find out what was happening after the war. The Second World War had seen the development of early computers under conditions of wartime secrecy. Actually, well, hold up. Uh, we need to go back a bit further and get some more context. But actually, before we do, let's just admire this background for another second or two. The term computer has been in use since the 17th century. It was a job for human beings. But it wasn't until World War I it became a profession. In both world wars, large numbers of human computers were required. And on both sides, these folks used the power of maths to make map grids and artillery tables. And most of these new essential human computers were women. Two years before this building was constructed, Grace Brewster Murray was born in New York City. A curious child, she once dismantled seven alarm clocks to see how they worked before her mother managed to stop her. I'm sure all the parents in the room understand that. Grace excelled at mathematics, achieving degrees from both Vassar and NYU, and married in 1930, taking her husband Vincent's surname. Grace Hopper got a PhD in 1934 from Yale and returned to Vassar, where she was on the tenure track. She took the classes that no one else wanted to teach. She'd update the old schoolwork and try entertaining new techniques, like building imaginary worlds in a mechanical drawing class. And this earned her growing student numbers in previously untrendy subjects and, of course, the unbridled resentment of her male peers. Then, when Grace was 36, this happened. Well, the actual Pearl Harbor, rather than the mid-2000s Michael Bay movie that's not as good as The Rock. Grace attempted to enlist, but was rejected because she was too old, too physically light, and too valuable as a mathematics professor. So she joined the reserves anyway. She graduated top of her class, and to her surprise, she was sent to Harvard to become the world's third computer programmer on a 10,000-pound computing machine named the Mark I. Grace was invaluable in understanding both the machine's capabilities and managing the volatile designer of the machine, Howard Aitken. Aitken gave Grace a code book, some strange-looking commands, and one week to write a program that could, that could compute interpolation coefficients to 23 decimal places. No, I don't know what that is either. The problem itself wasn't difficult for Grace with her PhD. But the machine itself was a mystery. It was the first computer. There was no precedent and, of course, no manual. Grace worked incredibly hard, applying her powerful intellect and extraordinary work ethic. Not bothered by the less than friendly welcome of the male programmers who didn't want to sit next to the woman. Aitken's boat was a strict Navy operation, meaning rank and competence were uppermost. And this meant the hopper rose through the ranks to become likely the most important figure in the organization, despite her gender. This page from her logbook contains a sellotaped moth that, attracted by the lights, flew into the Mark I and was beaten to death by the relays. The caption reads, first actual case of a bug being found. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, the electronic numerical integrator and computer was created. This buzzing, electrically dangerous room of cables and vacuum tubes was similar, but orders of magnitude faster than the Mark I. However, there was a flaw with this new beast of a machine. Whereas the Mark I took instructions on paper, the ENIAC needed to be reconfigured manually, cables and switches plugged and flicked for every new job. Whilst it could blaze through problems in comparison to the Mark I, a second of processing could take a day to set up. Plus, their cable management was awful. What Grace found when she arrived at the University of Pennsylvania was that she was no means the only female programmer. There were many other women who'd been working in similar roles. These women were key to this pioneering work. They latterly became known as the ENIAC 6. ENIAC itself was 8 feet tall and 80 feet long and weighed 30 tons. It had 40 panels arranged in a U-shape with 18,000 vacuum tubes each. And again, no manual. As Betty Jean described it, ENIAC was the son of a bitch to program. But program it, they did literally moving around inside the giant machine. The Bettys were the programming aces of the project. When the ENIAC was to be unveiled to the scientific community, they were given a short 12-day deadline to do an unprecedented set of ballistics calculations. It seems tech keynotes have always been prepared in the last minute. 
Despite working around the clock and drinking copious amounts of apricot brandy, apparently, by the night before, there were still serious errors in the program. The Bettys checked and rechecked against the test program that was hand-calculated by their colleagues. Dejected, they slumped home. The big demo was going to be an embarrassing disaster. But, like all good programmers, the answer came to Betty Holberton in her sleep. She made for the lab early, knowing precisely which of the 3,000 switches to flick to solve the problem. The lights were dimmed, and the calculation for the trajectory rippled across the neon lights of the ENIAC in merely 20 seconds, which is faster than the projectile could have been soared through the air. The demo had gone off spectacularly. The Bettys and Kay hustled to print souvenir sheets of results and handed them to the audience. The event made headlines. The women remember flashbulbs, but the photos in the papers showed only men posing with a thinking machine, sold as a giant brain doing thousands of calculations per second. But as we all know, ENIAC was not thinking. It was just doing what it was told really, really fast. In reality, the only giant brains in the room were the women walking amongst the panels on the ENIAC programming it. <sighs> Lots of long words in this one. Um, there's a couple of problems with the uh, New York Times' breathless reporting here. Uh, the work wouldn't have been done by a man before the ENIAC, and it willfully disregards the weeks of labor by a group of bloody women to produce the demo. This complex and creative programming work was seen as sub-professional, clerical work. As Jennings put it, if they'd known how crucial programming would be and how complex, they would have been more hesitant to give the job to women. On the 50th anniversary of the ENIAC, they rebuilt the room-sized computer on an integrated chip that could fit in your hand. And at the same time, Catherine Kleiman contacted the organizers of the Women in Technology Conference to see how they were planning to mark the 50-year anniversary of the ENIAC 6, who had inspired her during her Harvard undergrad. Except Witty had no knowledge of the women she was referring to. The ENIAC 6 had been so thoroughly swept under the rug that even a group dedicated to furthering the status of women in tech had no knowledge of the work they'd done five decades earlier. These women invented the idea that you could write programs. The next time you write a line of code, run a complicated program, or find a bug, know that in part it's due to these six women who programmed the ENIAC 75 years ago. Despite the erasure of their work, both at the time and for the decades afterwards, these women, and women like them, went on to have major impacts on the development of our profession over the course of their long careers. Grace Hopper would go on to write the world's first compiler, the A0, in 1951. And Betty Holburton and Grace would work together after the war, when the military projects finished. When Betty was working on UNIVAC, a successor to ENIAC, she not only ensured a uh, numeric keypad was next to the keyboard, but she also persuaded mechanical engineers to encase the black machine in a different color. And so beige became the color of computing for 30 years. She also wrote a program called a sort merge generator, which, according to Grace Hopper, was the first time a program had ever been used to write another program. The spectacular dexterity in such a concept that we now take for granted was, of course, initially resisted by the powers that be. Later iterations of Grace's compilers became mathematic and flowmatic, until in 1959 she buttonholed a well-known computer scientist and explained why she thought it was about time for, common, for a common programming language for business. Meetings followed, and general agreement formed in the fledgling industry. And using Grace's Navy connections, the Department of Defense stepped in to sponsor the work. Now, multiple committees were formed inside Codacil at different time horizons. Now, as we know, committees once formed become unbelievable expanding messes where deadlines disappear decades into the future, and Codacil was no different. Grace immediately realized the only group with a chance at succeeding was the short-range team. Luckily, this was Betty Holburton, Mary Hawes, and Jean E. Samet. They referred to themselves as the PDQ committee, because they needed it done pretty damn quick. And three months later, COBOL was the result. Now, it's pretty much no one's favorite programming language by today's standards. But it got done, adopted, refined, and most importantly, used because of the efforts of these three women. To give you an idea of the impact of COBOL, it's estimated in the year 2000, 80% of all production code in the world was written in it. That was a long time ago. In fact, I even did some dangerous research. NEAC 
Anyone got any idea how many Ruby jobs there are currently on LinkedIn? There are 12,000 Ruby jobs on LinkedIn, but there are 5,000 COBOL jobs. So we win! Yay, Ruby community! Uh, at the jobs board on the world's weirdest social network. Um, good. But that is still a pretty good showing for a 60-year-old language that nobody really likes. We're by no means special in our software writing world. If you weren't moderately well off, heterosexual, or a white guy, it has sucked for most of history. Here are some other brief examples. Crick and Watson were the fathers of DNA, but their Nobel Prize winning work on the double helix was based in part on the largely uncredited work of Rosalind Franklin. In 1967, Jocelyn Bell, as a research student, discovered the, world's, well, discovered the first pulsar. She found it by direct observation, unrolling miles of recordings and crawling on her hands and knees looking for unusual deviations in a single wiggling line until she recognized the pattern. It was jokingly called LGM-1, her little green men, and she had to overcome her skeptical supervisor, Anthony Hewish, to prove her discovery of a neutron star. Guess who got the Nobel Prize for physics? Not Jocelyn. Margaret Hamilton, the lead developer for the Apollo flight software and the famous tweet with the piles of paper, is uh, credited with having coined the term software engineering. She said, I fought to bring the software legitimacy, so those building it would be given the due respect, and I began to use the term software engineering. When I first started using this phrase, it was considered to be quite amusing. It was an ongoing joke for a long time. Oh, what's this? Is it a React conference? No. Savage. Um, in 1968, in Garmisch, NATO convened a conference where a great semantic change was agreed in between ski runs. It was decided we'd no longer call it programming, it would become software engineering, a new professional version of our job. Journals, societies, hiring practices, certification, formal education. The joke had become serious, and the dudes had swept in and claimed it. What had, become, what had begun as women's work had to be made more masculine. Radia Perlman holder of over 100 patents, including the Spanning Tree Protocol, an algorithm so fundamental to our modern self-healing networked world that it's no exaggeration to say that without it, there would be no internet. Have you ever heard of her? Susan Fowler joined Uber in 2015 as a site reliability, site reliability engineer. On her first day, her new manager sent a string of messages over company chat. He was in an open relationship, and he was looking for new sexual partners. Apparently, he was trying to stay out of trouble at work, but he couldn't help it because he was messaging people on their first day asking them to have sex with him. She immediately took screenshots of those chat messages and reported him to HR. Not much happened. Until her 2017 blog post about the pervasive sexualized culture of Uber, the emails were only the tip of the iceberg. It eventually led to the removal of the CEO. And I've used mostly white, well-to-do women in my examples so far. The suppression of other minority folks or folks where other stereotypes intersect is even greater. In recent years, we've even dramatized these stories. Alan Turing's cracking of the code for the Nazis and Enigma machine arguably shortened the Second World War by months, if not years. He was a man prosecuted by the state for his homosexuality and chemically castrated. Dorothy Vaughan, Catherine Johnson, and Mary Jackson's battles with segregation were in addition to the difficulty of their work as human computers during the space race. The book is better than the movie, by the way, even though the movie has Janelle Monet in it. Now, these films have their omissions, their fictions, their timeline compressions and composite characters, as does any dramatization of real life. And in this presentation, I've done some of the same, to highlight injustice as well as success. The fact remains that everyone featured in this presentation has had troubles and obstacles over and above what someone who looks like me would have had. Their contributions were minimized, re-legislated, blocked, forgotten, or ignored. That's an excellent suggestion, Mrs. Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. Because let's be honest, this talk's a bit awkward, isn't it? The painful truth in this cartoon from Punch is apparent in this conference too. I'm not sure if you've noticed, 
But I am a white, middle-class, middle-aged British man with a computer science degree who played a lot of video games as a kid. I could not be any more generic computer guy if I tried. Because it's not like this stuff isn't out there. The information, whilst perhaps new to some folks, isn't locked in a secret ladies-only history vault. I just had to bloody look for it. This talk isn't aimed at those folks. It's aimed, in the, it's aimed at the folks in here who look like me. And let's be honest, even more at the folks you know who might skip this talk, or who are looking at their laptops right now because this talk is not technical enough. I guess the reason I think it's okay for me to say these things, to point this stuff out, looking like me, is that maybe you'll pay attention, and maybe you'll fucking listen to me. So here's a few things we can do to make the situation better. Where can we borrow some great ideas? How about Web2? Flickr. Who remembers Flickr? It was like Instagram, except Yahoo bought it rather than Facebook. One of the founders, Stuart Butterfield, went on to create the unmanageable nightmare hellscape of Slack, in which you spend your days. But the community that grew around the product originally was the responsibility of co-founder Katerina Fake. She was behind the first draft of their community guidelines, which still exist to this day. So let us, like those skiing chaps in Garmisch, steal a great idea from a clever woman. You're probably imagining your personal worst encounter with that guy right now. There's a lot of versions of that guy. There's this one, very familiar to me as a conference organizer. I won't be taking questions at the end of the talk. Say it with me, don't be that guy. This guy is very wrong about this. If technology isn't political, why are big tech monopolies being questioned by the EU? Why are the crypto bros so desperate to create a currency outside the power of government? Politics is just a formalization of who has the power. If you believe politics isn't built into all the technology that you use, you're just saying you're happy with how the status quo worked out for you. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that people should want to work with you on your cool stuff because of you and not despite you. Say it with me. Don't be that guy. The idea of humor as an assertion of superiority goes back to the ancient Greeks. Plato wrote, taken generally, the ridiculousness is a certain kind of evil, specifically a vice. Consciously or not, humor and its reception subtly reveals the contours of power in a community. Who is deemed fair game and who isn't? Actual funny doesn't punch down. It reveals a truth about the teller. If you have to qualify a gag using this language, you are not a comedian, you are a dickhead. By punching down or excluding folks, you're reducing the likelihood that the next brilliant insight from the woman or black person or gay person or even quiet people in your team isn't shared with the group. Bullies were not cool at school, they were not cool in ancient Greece, and they're not cool now. Say it with me. Don't be that guy. Say it with me. Don't be that guy. I'm going to dwell on this one for a moment. This is my headshot on most stuff. It's nearly 10 years old, and I don't look that different. Now, whether that means I was an old-looking 32-year-old, or I am now a young-looking 42-year-old, I will leave to you. Now, I'm surprised I have to say this, but I know from kicking people out of my own events, and from the example of Susan Fowler, amongst others, that this apparently needs saying. I am not an irresistibly sexy human being, and neither are you. No one of any gender hearing me discussing the latest changes to the asset pipeline in a meeting, or even over a beer, is thinking, Fwah! I hope this riveting story is followed by his hand on my ass. This is likely true for you as well. So seriously, stop it. Just to be clear, this is not political correctness gone mad. It's the cold, hard facts of time's ravages on the human body. So we've talked about not doing stuff. So let's talk about what's in your head. Now, my best mate's dad used to have a saying, is don't assume 
or you make an ass of you and me. Now, as far as wordplay goes, this is pretty mediocre dad pun work. My kids wouldn't even look up, their, look up from their iPads to give me an eye roll. But it is good advice. You'd never judge a book by its cover. And this points out that you look like a pillock when you do. I find it baffling I have to say this too. But when you see someone who doesn't look like me at a conference, don't presume anything about their competency or their career. Ask them. We in the know like to call this conversation. Now, even if you aren't that guy, remember the circles. Remember your assumptions about Steve Shirley when I first talked about her. It takes effort not to stereotype. If you'd ever like your assumptions challenged, I suggest you watch this talk by Saron, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. Not even the beginning bit about the effect of torque nerves on the human digestive system. I am scared of getting it wrong. You're scared of getting it wrong. So many of our, of our behaviors are unexamined reactions to perceived threat. For me, it seems to boil down to two different flavors of fear. Now, oops fear is easy to solve. You do your best to be nice, and if you fuck up, apologize. No, I'm sorry that you were offended. A genuine, I'm sorry, I misspoke, and a resolve to do better. The fear of things getting harder is a tougher one. You may well have worked hard as an individual to get where you are, um, but on average, if you looked like me, it was a lot easier than if you didn't. You're just going to have to accept, on aggregate, that pushing against the stereotype is work you don't have to do. And honestly, the fact is things might well get harder for you when there's less ignoring of the potential of half of the human race because of how they look. Or perhaps considering maybe life isn't a race, a competition, and we're not in a zero-sum game. Or you can keep making excuses, and nothing will change. Finally, we're going to have a little chat about a couple of things you can do right now to make things better. Now, firstly, every manager I know well has a spreadsheet, either in reality or in their heads, about how the individuals in their team are paid. And every manager also knows who on that spreadsheet is underpaid. And some of those managers are in the room right now. If you take one action away from this talk, it is to fix the pay of the folks who deserve it. You will inevitably be fixing an inequality. Now, I say this mostly because it's the right thing to do, but as a side benefit, this will remove one reason why these folks might leave, which is going to save you stress and money in hiring a replacement for them. Open the notes up on your phone as you leave this room today and write down the names of the folks in your team whose pay you have to look at. You already know who they are. Why can't we hire women or black folks, they say. My gut is you're simply not trying hard enough. Sorry. And it's worth checking with your teammates and coworkers in an open and honest way whether the whisper network is against you. Has your business done anything that might make it the subject of back-channel gossip as a bad place to work? for non-generic computer dudes. Now, lots of teams have an original sin of what becomes one of these things is not like the other. You hire someone quickly to your team who hires someone else who looks like them from their network, who hires someone else, and then it repeats. And for a while, that's fine until our industry ends up looking like it does. It doesn't take many iterations of this loop to make a place pretty unappealing for the first person who breaks the pattern. It's more the case that most of these folks are too much like the others. You never built up the muscle of proper hiring or had to think about making an environment that might appeal to folks outside this demographic. Ironically, we could learn a lot from building teams from Sesame Street in how deliberately it makes sure it reflects the makeup of the world around it. If you're already in this predicament, you'll need to do the hard work to get out of it. Which brings me to this. We all like to give advice and make claims that our successes were made with zen-like wisdom and not in a panic with our fingers crossed. Me as much as the next person, which should be obvious given the thought leadering you're currently receiving. But advice is tricky. What worked for you might not work for folks who aren't like you, or maybe don't want your career. It's too easy to say, if you have an entrepreneurial streak, to believe it's the one true way to happiness and fulfillment. At best, your advice pulls people in the direction of your career, and at worst, it's difficult to execute or maybe actively harmful. So I'm going to suggest you think less like a mentor 
and more like a supporter with power to lend. In fact, this idea of using your power to lift folks up is the name of this tremendous talk by Amman Simmons. I saw him give it at RubyConf uh, in 2017, and he covers this ground with clarity and eloquence. In short, the, deci the, yeah. in short, the decisions you make push the world in the direction you choose. Only a tiny bit with each effort, but still worth doing over and over. Primarily, it's about giving power to others and not trying to be the center of the universe, said the man on stage in front of 700 people. So let's make that concrete. Look around your next meeting. When someone talks over someone, use the power you have to make sure that person is heard. Repeat their suggestions, give credit, and reinforce. That's hopefully what I'm doing with this talk. Wouldn't it be great if we took this cartoon and just stopped it being funny? Now let me bring this back to our community. I genuinely believe in the vast majority, we are a pretty enlightened bunch. I'm not having a go, or saying we have massive problems. How could we? We have this wonderful acronym. But I'm afraid it's not going to cut it for us computer white guys. Our nice is insufficient. It's a cop-out. So how about... Matt's is nice, and so we do the hard work and step in when folks are wankers even if it feels awkward and difficult and might be easier not to. Now, the acronym needs work. I will give you that. But we need to use our efforts to push against the easy path of how things have been, because hopefully I've shown you in the last half an hour that has sucked for lots of people. And it's not even the big stuff. You should step in on the awkward small stuff, take someone aside, and point out where they could have done better. I know that this, big and small, it's difficult, emotional, and hard. But then so is being someone who's excluded, even inadvertently, because of their gender, sexuality, or skin color. We can take this work on, and we should take this work on. And you shouldn't expect a grand thank you. And anyway, that's not why you're doing it, is it? For this talk, I've used these books, talks, and innumerable articles, all written by folks who didn't look like me. Different viewpoints on the same world stretching my empathetic muscles, being made to feel the uncomfortable, unrecognized benefits that I've received by dint of just looking like me. So I'm just going to say this to all the non-white dudes whilst I have the mic. You are welcome here. You make this community better. I'm sorry for the extra work you have to do. If you feel slighted or othered, please stay and shout, and we will make it better together. This is just a selection of the brilliant, impressive folks in our community who've inspired me, and in some cases, helped me with this talk. And for my fellow average computer guys, the urge to say, oh, it's not that bad, or I worked hard, or that's not what I'm like, is very strong. I know. But that's bailing out on making the world a better, more accepting, freer place for people who aren't like you and me. Let's take all those brilliant humans and not stand in their way, either deliberately or via a history in which you had no part in other than as a beneficiary. I'm better than that, and so are you. Thank you very much.